to you from underneath a peach blossom It's time for an episode of Be Awesome Find positivity throughout your life and work Just like our mascot rooster, Steve the Jerk Hello, Be Awesome listeners. You are listening to episode 37 of the Be Awesome podcast. I am super excited to be able to be here today in Washington, D.C. with an old friend of mine. Um, I'm actually at the only, and he's going to correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but the only full-size ice arena in all of Washington, D.C., the Fort DuPont Ice Arena, and I'm with Executive Director of the Ice Arena, uh, Ty Newberry, who also just recently became the Israeli national hockey coach, right? Correct, uh, yes. Well, well, welcome to the podcast, and thanks for having us. Welcome up. Uh, Thank you for being here. I have to open up with one thing that I got to do today. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I got to share I got to share it with people because it's like... Check it off the bucket list. Everybody's going to be like jealous of this. I got to drive a Zamboni. That was absolutely one of the all-time greatest things I got to do, and as I shared with you, it's the strangest thing. As someone that grew up playing hockey and skating, you know, when you went to the hockey game, it was always just cool to watch that person pushing that Zamboni around, but you taught me some stuff about the Zamboni, about cutting, and just before we get into the podcast, give me some give me some of the rundown of what that Zamboni does and the and the intensity that it cuts and all that, because that was interesting to listen to on just the, the Perfect, tour. yes, I, well, I, I actually teach a lot of courses for the U.S. Ice Rink Association on ice maintenance and equipment operations, so what uh, one fact that a lot of people don't know about artificial ice is, is it's the second hardest uh, substance to cut. A diamond is the hardest thing to cut, and artificial ice ranks number two. So mm -hmm. uh, when we take the ice resurfacer out, we're doing more than just laying water. We uh, shave about a 32nd of an inch of ice. Uh, we have to collect that snow uh, with, a, with a conveyor system and a dump tank. We also wash the ice, but the washing of the ice actually mixes with snow to create a slush. And that's what fills in a lot of those really deep ruts and grooves. And then finally, we replace the ice uh, with uh, hot water, which is uh, what you, people see at the end there with a little yeah. bit of steam coming out. We use hot water to replace the ice. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a contraption. And it was created by Frank Zamboni in 1949. And his four principles that he had on that very first machine are still used by all ice resurfacers around the world today. And I did three of them today. You did three of them. Yeah, yes. no, that's 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 an accomplishment. You did shave for me. and yeah. cut ice and replace it. Yeah, so. yeah. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit here on how we got here. So uh, Ken Wirtz, mutual friend of ours, hockey coach, uh, which I'm a huge advocate and love to hear about the programs to getting people better to be better coaches. You were at a program for that mm -hmm. uh, where you spoke, and Kenny said, "Hey, you got to you know, have you thought about keynote speaking and." introduced me to you and you and I had some discussions and then I saw you do a keynote uh, which was fantastic and we'll get into that with a with a remarkable story um, and in your story you shared about the DuPont uh, the Fort DuPont ice arena and where it is and what what goes on what's gone on here and where we are in, in Ward 7 give give a little background on where where we're at and the kind of the the the, the way of the world around here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, we are the only full-size indoor ice rink in Washington, D.C., and we sit in Ward 7. Uh, we are east of the Anacostia. Uh, Ward 7 and Ward 8 are typically known as the most underserved communities in Washington, D.C. Uh, the statistics and the numbers that are out there between the highest violence rate, highest crime rate, highest teenage pregnancy, high childhood obesity. I mean, you name the statistics that you really don't want associated with the neighborhood that you live in. They exist here. And so we, as the Fort DuPont Ice Arena, we have our programs we call Kids on Ice. And what we do is we remove all cost of barrier to participate. Uh, hockey, figure skating have become a very high level, uh, high income sport. And through our programs, we turn nobody away due to a lack of pain. So we serve over 3,000 kids. Uh, most of them are free of charge or extremely subsidized. Mm -hmm. We provide the lessons, the skates, the equipment, the instruction, the ice, you name it. They uh, just show up at the door and... Show up, have the right attitude, be happy, and uh, get out on the ice and work hard. And, 
and that's that's the heart of what we do, or that's kind of the hook, I guess I should yeah. say, in what we do. But in addition to that, we do a lot of enrichment programs, uh, mentoring, study buddies, and we do a lot of things. Our focus is less on developing ICE athletes and more focused on developing future citizens. That's a that's a great way to great way to put it. And you do a lot a lot of other things we're going to get into, but. What is what's happened in this neighborhood in this area since this program has started? What's what's the change look like? What is what's the impact been? I saw your map downstairs. Talk about like what what does that what does that all mean? So when you walk into the building, the first thing you're going to see is a big map of the United States, and what that has on it is uh, stickers of universities and colleges that kids from our uh, program have moved on to. And we've had them as far away as Oxford, England, uh, McGill in Montreal. We got some out in California and Utah. Uh, We have currently uh, our third kid at Harvard uh, entering her first year of law school there. We have our second one at MIT right now, one at University of Pennsylvania. So very, very good schools. And these kids, most of these kids leave and take their skates with them. Mm -hmm and participate there so the two at harvard and one at mit right now skate on the same adult team up there so they still participate we have two young gentlemen who started skating in our program here 12 years ago uh, who are freshmen at east carolina university and they are roommates you know that's cool this is the bond that uh, helps out. We have two uh, young ladies, I just found out from one of them, uh, working on their doctorate that she will be done this spring. Yeah. Uh, so again, the the ice is the consistency for them. They take their skates and participate. When they come back here during the summers or during their off time, they are here volunteering and giving back and being incredible role models uh, to the next generation of skaters coming up. So yeah um that's that's one one thing you just said about volunteering that triggered was uh was hearing a story about one of the team members here and what he what he gave right the that he gave a year's worth of 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 work i mean yes we're 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 not for profit and like most not for profits we struggle yeah. <laughs> you know our focus is putting kids on the ice and when the housing market had its hiccup a number of years ago financially we were in a very very tough situation. Uh, and one of our, our team members here, uh, mm-hmm. Mike Molinex, came and said, hey, you know what? My wife's got a good job. She's a lawyer with the EPA. Uh, you don't have to pay me. I just I, I want to be here. My kid participates here. I want to be a part of this. And volunteered 20, 24 hours a week, uh, cutting ice for me in the morning and helping out wherever. So it, there's a lot of good energy here. We're, we're very There's fortunate. a ton of good energy. When I walked in, you know, we walked in and everybody that we saw – you know, hello, good morning. You know, if someone was sweeping up or something, they stopped to at least say, you know, say hello. Can I help you? Uh, it's a ton of good energy. And to be in a neighborhood where there's a lot of negative energy, uh, that's there's something to be said about that. I mean, one of the things that you and I talked about was um, food. Mm-hmm. You know, something that so many of us take for granted. And I think you told me it was uh, 88,000 people have one supermarket yep. and it happens to be two miles away where most of these people don't have a car. Correct. So, yeah, you know, we're in a health food desert. You wouldn't think that to be in inside of a city, but yeah, two miles away, eighty-eight thousand people that grocery store feeds. So, we partnered up with uh, DC Urban Greens to create a, a urban garden here, mm-hmm. uh, which last year injected over ninety-five hundred pounds of fresh vegetables into the community. Wow. Uh, one of the reasons why we uh, focus a lot about that here with the rink is number one is is this area has the highest birth defect rate. And I know a lot of people think, oh, you know, it's probably the crack moms or the drugs. But the number one reason for uh, birth defect in this area is actually malnutrition mothers. Uh, so because there's a high birth defect rate, we do a lot with Special Olympics. We mm-hmm. have a great Special Olympics program here, and we want to try to prevent that from being any, those numbers growing, hopefully yeah. by injecting... Uh, as we mentioned, fresh vegetables into the community. And, you know, it's 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 also interesting. There's a lot of kids here who haven't been out of the city. Mm-hmm. And if they haven't been out, if they've been out of the city, they've been to Prince George's County right next door to us. Mm-hmm. Most of these kids haven't driven on a farm road and seen 
uh, farms, seeing food being yeah. grown in the lab. Food comes a out of A lot of box. kids have no idea. Yeah, yeah, they have no idea that food's coming from the ground. They just assume that it comes in a box, right? Yeah, exactly what you said. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the. I think you, you've you've heard about my pumpkin paddle uh, with the with the that program, and the whole idea was to, to grow pumpkins on school grounds because exactly. kids don't know where food comes from. Exactly. Um, you know, you, you said something uh, there that about birth defects. And about what people's perception or thoughts are, and then what it really is. Uh, where does where does Ty get the thought? I don't think for a second, knowing you, I don't know you extremely well. I think I know you well enough to make this statement. I don't believe that Ty Newberry would ever, under the circumstances of someone saying, "Oh, that place has got high birth defects." Let's get this. I don't see a Ty Newberry saying uh, that's because there's. Everybody does crack there. Everybody does something. You you would dig to find that answer yep. and and then try to find a solution because I mean this is this is your passion. Uh, you know you're 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 giving essentially your life and, and you know potentially a, a, a greater livelihood yep. um, to do these things. But where does where does that innate thinking come in where you just go? It, it it might be that, but let's let's dig to it and then let's figure out a solution. I mean, you you literally have greenhouses next to the hockey rink. I've never seen anything anywhere <laughs> like this, and you put a fruit a food stand outside and sell it at a very very reasonable, fair, affordable rate for just about anybody. Where do, where does that where does that come from? Yeah, that's uh, I don't know. That's a good question. You know uh, the the two mottos that anybody who's been around this rink and has worked with me or volunteered they hear me to say two things yours is be awesome right yep. mine is we have to do better like i might not have all the answers but my staff will hear we need to do better like i don't know what i can't always define that but yep. let's find ways of doing better and i think that has a little bit to do with this getting the garden going and, and the programs things like that is we just got help us find ways of being better and the other thing that we, we preach around here quite a bit is we need to help others succeed. Mm -hmm. It's our responsibility to help others succeed. And it doesn't matter what context that is in. You know, if it's we put out registration forms and they didn't get our registration form back on time, you know, mm -hmm. they should have known. And, you know, my response to the staff will be, no, no, no. We didn't set them up for success. Mm -hmm. We knew they wanted to sign up. Yeah. Okay, we need to make the effort to reach out to them. Yeah. And that's, you know, a little bit of things we do with our staff here and, and things like that is just we're, we, we have created a culture. We've been very fortunate of just trying to help others succeed no matter what that is, whether it's uh, providing food for kids here, providing clothing, uh, studying, tutoring, mentoring, whatever it may be. Uh, our goal and objective is, is just to help people succeed that's that's really what we focus on did have you ever just like you drive 25 miles here every day and i'd be lying if first of all i didn't know where i was going and i told you i got <laughs> I, I, I drove up and down we left the airport uh we went over to uh to the maryland side for a co convention that we're going to be at for a couple days and and i uh, picked up avery to come over here um and driving over here there was some huh this is a this isn't this isn't a neighborhood, you know, lock the doors, roll the windows up, you know, kind of feeling, I don't want to say unsafe, but questioning, you know, where you were at and everything else. You get in your car every day, you drive 25 miles through this neighborhood, you've you've literally either seen or been in close proximity to shootings. Yes. Do you ever say, what am I doing? Uh, no, no, not really. I mean, it's... Again, it's just trying to help others. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm very fortunate. My, my wife and I, we're here together yeah. every day. You know, we know the families in this community, and we know there's a lot of bad here, but there are a lot of good people who are trying very hard in this community. And a lot of people want to say, oh, you know, education isn't important, and, you know, whatever it may be, and, and they blame it on crime and, and poverty, and people just don't care, and they're getting these handouts and things like that. But there are a lot of really good families and a lot of really good parents doing the best they can with what they have. And some of them are working two, three, four part-time minimum wage jobs to provide for their family. Okay? They're just not there because they're doing the best they can. Or maybe they don't have the resources. 
And that's where we focus a lot of time in is, is doing a lot of enrichment programs, mentoring programs, study buddies, trying to be that outlet mm-hmm. for some of those parents and being a safe place for kids to come. One of the things that, you know, I, I have to stress with my staff a lot. We're very lucky. Most of my managers here and people who are day to day with our customers and our kids, you know, they've been here six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Mm-hmm. We don't have a high turnover rate here. We are the consistency in a lot of these kids' lives. Mm-hmm. And we forget that. You know, I had a one young lady who called me, the one who's up at Harvard, Leah. She called me two years ago and she says, Hey, she says, uh, Mr. Ty, can you, can you write a letter of recommendation for me? And I said, Yeah, absolutely. I said, What's it for? She says, Well, I'm applying to become a Rhodes Scholar. I said, whoa, 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 time out. You need somebody smart to write that, okay? I'm not, I'm yeah. not that guy. Yeah. And she says, well, you know, she says, outside of my family, I've known you longer than anybody else in my life. Yeah. You know, and we forget that when we work with kids that we are, for some of them, the consistency in their lives. Yeah. And for, you know, you know, the statistics are out there about how many single parent households we have currently right now and a lot of my staff here are males Mm -hmm. and they may be that consistency in the male role model right and we hire within the community the best we can we do a lot of job training i'm trying to push them off yeah to go make more money now that they've gotten the skills and things like that but they stay here because they feel strong bond here and it's really special for me to have my staff who lives within the neighborhood come up to me and says hey you need to pull William aside the next time he's here. You mm-hmm. know, they're they're our ears. They're yeah. they're in the community. They know when our kids are starting to kind of maybe walk over to the other side and help by being there and then by sending kids to see some of us here to have to sit down and talk and get them on the right path. I gotta tell you, in corporate America, especially in in, in I'm in I'm in sales and marketing is my mm-hmm. been my specialty. Turnover rate, retention rate. You know, the, the you you have companies that are flipping their entire staff yearly, or I think the national average in technology is like forty percent. Um, they're do, and they're leaving for money, which I always say leaving for money is never the first reason why people leave. Exactly. But you've you figured out the fulfillment formula, which is people feel fulfilled coming in here, not making a lot of money, in some cases not making any money, yep. given everything they got. And being able to smile, be the first, potentially the first and last smile that some of these kids see in a day, and that's exactly. good enough. That there's a lot of that. Yes, I mean it's it's pretty powerful. You know, it's people who maybe weren't set on a path to impact kids' lives, mm-hmm. uh, who find themselves working here and find the opportunity to make that connection. Uh, it's a very powerful connection when kids come to you and need help, whether it's in the rink or things outside of the rink Mm -hmm. and we work really hard with our staff I mean we don't have much we can provide them as far as financial resources but we do treat them and take care of them no differently than we do uh, our kids here you know we we helped one kid who or one manager here whose father uh, passed away recently regarding getting the funeral going and Mm -hmm. and helping offset some of those costs for him uh you know, we've helped some find housing, we've provided cell phones, you know, never in my life have I worked in an environment where I would ever consider giving employee advances. Mm -hmm. But here we do that. Here I went to my board and they support that. Because if I don't, if you need the $30 to get you to the next pay period, if I'm not giving it to you, then you're going to one of those cash places right. that are charging a huge, huge percentage, percentage okay so <coughs> why why are we putting our staff there so uh we, we we do spend a lot of time focusing on developing our staff caring for our staff's needs outside of the rink yeah uh and in in exchange we expect them uh to be the role model and leaders inside the building that uh, a lot of these kids who don't have a male role model to look up to can look up to you know, that's a um, thinking about what that for an employee to come to you to ask for an advance okay. is a lot more monumental than most people would probably think about and probably just passed over. That's an enormous amount of trust 
that's uh, an ability to feel that they can communicate. They won't be judged. They won't have like I don't know anybody that that you know I work with or that I have direct relation to that I could say they would go to their boss or they would go to someone when times got tough and say, hey, can you help me out? They would go to the high percentage. They would go to a credit card. They would go to something. That's family. That's, I mean, you, this, this family atmosphere, atmosphere and feeling, it's amazing. And I, I just, I, I sit here and I look at where we are and I look at what you're trying to do. Like, a hockey rink in the middle of Ward 7, yep. tough area, everything else. And you guys just keep going every single day. I'm just, I'm floored by it. And you're putting people in, you're helping put people in Harvard and MIT. I'm not, I wouldn't say that they wouldn't get there anyway. Right. But no, I would, I would right. absolutely say that a positive environment that they're in here gives them hope which is the greatest thing anybody can have that many people are, are neglected from. And, and that's just not here. Um, that's in a lot of places. But, you know, we listen to the news. We listen to people. I mean, everybody, especially social media. Social media is killing me lately. I, I, I talk about it on just about every single podcast. I, I, people automatically go to the most negative, just, just like, oh, I can't believe this. This is terrible. Da, 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 da. They, they, they expect the best, report the worst. Um, and that's that's in social media. We're in, we're in, we're here, and yeah. and this is a this should be a very easy place to get discouraged and down. And you guys flip it around, and you just, I mean, I, I can't get over it. <laughs> we're very fortunate. We have a lot of fun. We have yeah. a lot of good families. We we yeah. do have a ton of success stories, but we've also lost a lot of kids, and that's crushing. You know, we we lose kids to the gangs or the streets or whatever it may be. They stop showing up, and it it is crushing. But you know, one of the areas where we've had a lot of success in is uh, female athletes. Yeah. And there's uh, currently we're up to sixty percent of our participants are female. Wow. Uh, which is huge because in the underserved areas there isn't a lot of opportunities for girls to participate in sports mm -hmm. you know it's cool to hang out on the basketball court maybe till you're eight or nine but you know then it's not cool for girls to be out there right. much anymore and the statistics and the studies that show that uh, females involved in sports growing up it's you know three times more likely to graduate less likely to be a teenage mother you know uh, more likely to not have weight issues whether mm -hmm. it's one extreme or the other, whether right. it's, you know, uh, being a bulimic or anorexia or right. being overweight. And, you know, there's, there's a study and they, they surveyed the Fortune 500 female executives. And it was over 90% of them participated in sports growing up. Wow. Well. So, I didn't know that. you know, the discipline, you know, all the byproducts from yeah. participating in sports. You know, we all, we grew up playing hockey, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the discipline, the teamwork, the adversity, the fall down, you get up, whatever it may be, sports teaches you those lessons. You may not realize those lessons as you're growing up, mm -hmm. but once you get into those situations at work where you got to sit and work with somebody you don't like, Mm -hmm. Just as we might have had a teammate on our line that we didn't like, but the overall goal was more important yeah. than anything else. So the life lessons are very important. And, and you know, a, a lot of our females are just doing incredible things. And the other unique thing about our facility is we meet a lot of personalities. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be fast and be on the edge, we have short track speed skating. Mm -hmm. And there are kids who like to skate and skate fast and, like I said, be right on that, the, the finest part of that medal from tipping over, right? Right. And crashing into the pads. Uh, we have hockey where if you want to be a little more anonymous and aggressive, you can put on your helmet and gloves and go out there and, and be a little more physical. Mm -hmm. And then we have, you know, our synchronized skating and our figure skating. And, you know, for a lot of kids, you know, I didn't see it right away. It took me a little while to figure this out. but. I tell you what, there's there's some kids who have tough lives. Oh yeah. And you put them in a pretty dress, and you put them out on the ice to pretty music, and you can see their self image and their self esteem just shooting wow. through the roof. I mean, it is so incredible uh, that you know, it just it's absolutely incredible to see those kids out on that ice participating together. And uh, so 
So we meet a lot of personalities, which yeah. makes it good too. So, well, the female skaters, you know, while we're on that subject, I think I saw a, a screenshot of you at the Olympics. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you you were at the Olympics. So, why were you, Why were you there? So uh, Mame Biney uh, is the first black uh, female speed skater in U.S. history. Uh, she was 18 years old last year in Pyeongchang, uh, and she had qualified for the Olympics. And being 18 years old, and she uh, qualified in three distances. And my wife and I went out uh, to support her and her father. We helped raise some money for her father to be able to go out and see his daughter uh, participate. And it was just an uh, incredible experience. It was a lot of fun, and she has just got the most magnetic personality, the happiest person you would ever meet. Uh, she's currently, uh, past few years, has been skating for the U.S. Speed Skating National Team. She is uh, based out of Utah now and going to school there as a freshman. She actually left the Olympics, came home for a few days, and then... Uh, went to Europe to compete in the World Junior Championships that she won. So if she can stay healthy and stay focused, uh, we have we hope for good things for her coming up in 2022. And she still stops by. She still stops by. Her dad still lives in Virginia. Yep. And uh, when she does come home, it's a little tough for her now with all of her uh, competitions. You mm -hmm. know that there isn't much downtime. But when she does make it home. Uh, she does stop by when we do fundraisers. Uh, her father, we do silent auctions every once in a while, and her father and her will reach out and say, hey, put us down for an hour skating with Mom May, mm -hmm. you know, uh, auction that time off and the meet and greet and things like that. So uh, they reach out to us uh, probably more than we reach out to them, which is uh, very, very warming to us. Was her ambition to be an Olympic speed skater? I, I don't know, you know, that's that's a hard question. Not early on. Yeah. I mean, you know, here's a kid who shows up who just likes to go fast. Uh, she <laughs> she actually started in a Learn to Skate program in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, she just couldn't, she would do everything at 120 miles an hour, right? Mm -hmm. And the coach actually was familiar with our program over here and said to her and her dad, you know what? you should probably go over and try speed skating if that's the way you want to skate. And, and you know, after a month of lessons or so, she ends up here and she participates here. And uh, if you've ever seen her in your interviews, all smiles, all energy, always happy. Yeah. And she would show up and race against the big kids and, uh, and compete and just a lot of passion, a lot of hard work. Well, I think I saw an interview maybe after one of the races. She, she didn't win, obviously. Uh, um, but she did. She had a big smile on her face. Yep. And you would swear that if the commentator didn't say what place she came in, which I can't remember what place she yep. came in, you would think that she had won because she was so appreciative just at the opportunity to be there. And what was amazing about that is what you see in sportsmanship in a lot of other areas and a lot of places and, and it's probably some in speed skating is poor sportsmanship. And I, what I saw in her, and I, I don't, I don't know if you, from, if you saw the interview. I'm sure you did. Um, it was one of the post race ones. She was just beaming. Yep. She was just, she was happy. Like she's like, I'm happy to be here. I did my best. You know, here, here it is. Um, which I'm sure that's what you guys instill here. Win or lose, just give your all, and you know we can always do better. But don't get, don't get discouraged. I think at the at what's happened, get encouraged to, to move forward. Yep, and that's that's a lot of it. I mean, her personality is a lot of our rank. Yep. You know, it's just, hey, give it y'all. Be satisfied. Be happy. That's yep. all we ask. Yep. Okay? Just just do your best. Yeah. And if you can walk away doing your best, we, we could care less. We, our focus is heavily on uh, recognizing effort over achievement mm -hmm. you know we want our kids to fail if they are trying their hardest right we want them to fail by trying something new so we are we are constantly pushing them out of that comfort zone mm -hmm. and we are okay with 
them failing. Right? Well, that's where a lot we of we celebrate. Well, well, that's yeah. the, well, that's that's where you really should celebrate. Exactly, is when you know that that failure is coming at that person giving every bit of one hundred percent that they got. Because that's Absolutely. that's the only way that, that that that's the only way that you get better is pushing your limits. I always talk about, you know, when I when I'm and and this is from the business side. I I always had this saying with um, regard to sales when we have quotas and people would you know it didn't matter what the number was. You give a number of a dollar, and you know you, you you would always get pushback because oh I can't believe they gave this number because they you know it's unrealistic right? right? Oh, it's unrealistic. I can't yeah. do it. And I always would say. Focus on what's possible and not what's required. Exactly. Because what's possible is so much greater than anything that someone would give you as a requirement. But give everything you got. And, you know, pushing that envelope is going to come with failure. And too often people get content and they get in that comfort zone. They get in that bubble and they go, that's good enough. And there's a line that I, I stole from a, a facilities department at public school. It's got a big gold plaque at their front door and it says if better is possible good is not enough every child every day um, awesome yeah and I, I that's the, I take that with me everywhere I just sit, sit and look at that stuff um, but yeah it's it, people are afraid to fail and they don't understand that the only time that you actually fail is when you don't try to begin with when you don't actually give that effort and you should celebrate it and you know hey it didn't all go the way that it went but it was evident in her after race interview that it was like wow these, these she's she's got it like yep. she's got the secret sauce she does um, for sure so and great that she learned some of it here and she passes it on when she's when she's in town um I, you know, i'm looking at all these these pictures and these programs and the learn the skates and we we had a little time to, to teach uh, my good friend avery from alabama who's sitting in the background quiet i think he's still beaming with he got to drive the zamboni and skate too um, you know, let's talk a little bit about you for for a minute on your coaching expeditions because you got a couple of good ones. I mean, you're, <laughs> how does that how does how does how do how does Ty in Washington D.C. get to be the Israeli national coach or that you're coaching somewhere else right now? Lithuania, too. Too, yeah. yeah, with their coach stuff. Yeah. I, you know, I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess just luck. Yeah, uh, you know. I have been very, very fortunate in my life to somehow attach myself to good people. Yep. And uh, and a number of years ago, I was speaking at the NHL Coaches Association. They had a, a coaching clinic, and I sat across the table from a, a German guy who was the head coach for Lithuania. Yep. And he and I had a good conversation, and I spoke the next day, and then I was headed out of town. And he and I just kind of kept in touch, and uh, and then one day he reached out and said, "Hey, I got uh, tryouts." He actually Germany was holding the World Championships, and he asked me if I'd come out. I said, "I can't come out. I got other commitments." Uh, he says, "Well, could you come out a month early and and help me with uh, the Lithuanian national team camp and tryouts?" And so I did. So it was fun. I knew nothing about Lithuania prior to going there. I didn't know the language, the currency, anything. It's just yeah. like, okay, all I know is I'm landing in a place called Vilnius yeah. and Burnt is going to pick me up. That's about the extent that I knew of it. And had a great time and worked with them there. And uh, the following year, he asked me if I'd stay for the World Championships and stayed on and was on the bench with him during the World Championships. And we were in the uh, group 1B that year and won the World Championships. So it was a lot of fun. And then they changed head coaches to a gentleman by the name of Dan Lacroix, who played in the NHL and coached in the NHL. And uh, he was familiar with me when he was on the staff in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And during the transition, he'd asked if I'd stay on. And I stayed on. And then uh, over in Israel, when I was visiting there this summer, uh, the president president of their federation uh, pulled me aside and said, hey, uh, I think it's a good idea that you uh, come coach Israel instead of Lithuania. What do you think? Yep. I thought, ooh, I don't know if that's a good deal or not. Yep. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a, a level down. Yep. Uh, but, you know, my wife and I have done a lot of work with the Israeli Hockey Federation and the yep. schools over there and, and their government. And uh, we sat down and 
had some negotiations and uh, was very blessed and fortunate that they thought of me and offered me to coach their teams. You know, something funny is I've known you for a couple of years. I've followed you with your videos and I've watched, you know, I've seen you speak. I followed the rank. I've never once thought to ask you what your personal experience in hockey play. When did you start skating? You know, how <laughs> far did you go? Because you just have, like, I'm just like, dude knows his stuff. He's like, you know what I mean? Lithuania's I'm calling good at him. It. <laughs> Lithuania's calling him. Israel's calling him. All these people call him. He's at the Olympics. He knows his stuff. Uh, when did you start skating? And how much do you still skate? You know, what is. So I, I, I grew up in Michigan, yeah. uh, in a town called Saginaw, Michigan. My, uh, I started playing for the at the age of four at the Greater Amateur so, uh, Hockey so, Greater Saginaw Amateur Hockey Association. So I started when I was four playing. Uh, at the age of 14, I started with the knee surgeries. Yep. And my playing career or life I knew was coming to an end, and that's when I started getting into coaching. Mm-hmm. And so for a number of years, I was playing and coaching at the mm-hmm. same time. And, you know, when I grew up, I grew up in a, a single parent household. My parents divorced and my mom uh, wasn't working much at the time. And there were hockey families who basically helped her make sure that my brother and I stayed in hockey. Mm-hmm. And whether that was picking us up or paying dues or whatever it may be and you know so my life now has come full circle is yep. getting kids involved and making sure they stay involved and that the cost isn't the barrier so anyway so then I, I, I coached for a number of years I was fortunate to coach at the university level for a number of years and, and got out of that uh, I coached uh, last with Penn State University in 2000 mm-hmm. and figured uh, we won the national championship and figured okay well I've kind of hit the coaching apex and yeah going to get married and it was time to start a real life I had extended adolescence that late in life I thought mm-hmm. I was doing pretty good and <laughs> so I got into running ranks and ended up in Utah opening up a practice facility for the 2002 Olympics and got roped back into coaching there and uh, shortly after that I spent probably about uh, 15 years ago coach, 15 years or more coaching coaches yep and looked at the development of players, looked at development of coaching, and wrote a lot of the curriculum uh, manuals and presentations for USA Hockey and started presenting uh, all over the United States, and then which turned into internationally. And yep. that's where I met Ken. Ken had uh, come suffer through a coaching clinic with me and and was uh, fortunate enough to come up and and have a conversation that started what I think is a great relationship with him and, and yep. you also. So it's kind of it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's pretty cool. And I, and I love, you know, I think a lot of people look at um, coaches as people that played, you know, good portion of their life and then they just kept at it. And um, you, you had a, a, a short career of actually playing, but yep. you had a long career of coaching and, um, and that's, I don't know if you've listened to my podcast with David Cooks. He, he wrote a book from, from Paralysis to Purpose. He actually was a fanatic of basketball, loved basketball. He was a, he was a, he was a good player. Um, but he ended up becoming uh, paralyzed, um, at, I think, around the age of 14. Okay. And he, he pursued, because he had such a love for the game, and he knew he couldn't play it, he pursued coaching. All the way to the point where he was at Duke and he was he was pushing to be part of uh, Coach Fee's basketball team, and he was shagging balls in his wheelchair and giving everybody Gatorade just to be part of the yeah. the staff when they won um, the NCAA Final Four. I can't remember the year. Um, so it's it's great to see that 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 it's it's the passion of the game and not just the natural evolution of oh I can't play anymore. Um, but what I really like, I there was a, a post on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago. Um, our CEO actually put a, a, a story about his coach and when they lost a the game and the coach, you know, the kids were acting up on the bus and the coach basically, you know, gave him an earful. And someone made this post about, you know, the analogy and this is why kids don't play sports anymore because, you know, the coaches and everything else. There's actually 13 different reasons why um, the, the um, number of kids 
playing sports is going down. Mm -hmm. Um, He was absolutely accurate in the fact that poor coaching is one of the 13. The number one is socioeconomic. People can't afford it. And so you're, you're tackling a couple of those things. First, you're doing the socioeconomic. I'm looking at these pictures. All these kids, no questions asked, show up. You don't got to pay to play. We just want you to play. And the second thing that you're doing that's unbelievably admirable is the statistic is only 20% of coaches, uh, the statistic is 20% of coaches are properly trained to be coaches. And I think it's somewhere around 60% of coaches are parents of a child that they're coaching, which makes that um, favoritism or reverse favoritism, right? Because you've got that pendulum swing. So you either got the parent that's a coach and the the kid, you know, Josh is the best and Josh is going to get in every play. Or you got that pendulum that swings all the way over the other way that says, I'm not going to give my kid any sort of favoritism. I'm going to bench him just to bench him just to show. And they're both penalized. There's never really a sweet spot in the middle that says, I'm going to treat my kid like every other kid. Why? It's my kid. Right. Um, So the fact that you're doing these programs and the coach to coaches and to get these people going and – yeah, yeah, Kenny was telling me it was like a two day, was it two days? Yeah. You know, two day intense training. I love the fact that I see more with ho- I love hockey. Yeah. So I love to see that hockey seems to be at the forefront of doing this. Have you seen other sports have other sports reached out to you and said, Hey, you know, could you yeah, a cook? Lot. <laughs> really? A lot. Yep. That, that, that that's yep. that's awesome. I hope more do. Yeah, and you know, hockey's interesting because we're we're kind of at the forefront right now. Yep. We've uh, about 10 years ago, USA Hockey came out with the American Development Model, which was looking at the development of children, the science, the uh, behind the windows of trainability and all these different things uh, that go into the development of an athlete. And we've been implementing a lot of decisions, which is good for development, not mm-hmm. necessarily good for mom and dad watching junior watch a hockey game, right? Yeah. And to that point that the U.S. Olympic Committee has actually stepped in uh, two years ago and basically has taken what we have been applying Mm -hmm. and applying it across sports to all the national governing bodies that fall under the U.S. Olympic Committee. So here we are as hockey as we're passionate about it. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things in the United States, it's maybe a top five sport at youth level. I mean, it's... It's maybe not even that, but the yet, numbers what of, we're doing is higher. Yep. The numbers of players is the lowest yep. of any. So you've got you know soccer worldwide's two hundred and fifty yep. million total players. Uh, basketball's twenty six million, uh, and I, I know the numbers are off, the, uh, are going to be off a bit. But the, the 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 variable is there's less than a million people playing active hockey, you know, organized hockey yep. in the world. Yep, not just the United States in the world. So there's not a lot of people playing hockey, uh, and I, it's, I'll have to pull it up and I'll put it somewhere on this podcast in the description. But it's it's the lowest number of people playing. Partly, most likely the uh, the socioeconomic, the cost, absolutely the cost piece, because it's probably well, it might not be the top five. It's, it's got to be the top one in cost. Yeah. Uh, you know, between pads, ice time, uh, travel time, everything else. Um, it, it's it's expensive. I mean, it's 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 expensive to run to keep ice moving at uh, you know seventy degrees outside today. Yes. Uh, so to keep that full full sheet of ice going. So um, you know, let's let's uh, let's let's close it up with uh, this has been fantastic. First of all, first thanks thanks for opening up your space to us. Oh, this has been thanks out. for sharing you know the, your team. Uh, I'm gonna put some pictures and some video out of what you guys are doing. Um, you're always looking for for support. And it doesn't come, and you shared with me, I I, uh, ignorantly figured you had all these, you know, large corporate, you know, deep pocket folks that are stroking big checks for you to keep this, keep this running for the kids. But the reality is you count on a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of little checks um, that every dollar, that every dollar counts. So how do people support your your uh your rank your efforts your your program uh great question and thank you for the opportunity uh the, probably the easiest way is to go to our website uh which is www.fdia.org as in fort dupont ice arena fdia.org 
And on there, we have different ways of uh, supporting us, whether it be through donations, whether it's uh, people's time or energy or resources. Uh, we survive off of volunteers here at the facility. Uh, we survive uh, by the generosity of people. And like you said, we don't have any major uh, one individual that underwrites this program. Uh, we're amazed that the number of checks that we get every year that come from all over this country, mm -hmm. uh, people that have heard our program, and and you know sometimes it might only be for five dollars. Yep. But that five dollars to that person who's writing the check is probably way more than the five hundred dollar check we get from somebody, right? And right. It's just. Uh, but I, I don't know how people hear about us all over the country, but we're yeah. we're thankful that uh, they do, and, and we here work very hard to make sure that those dollars that come in that people are kind enough to give go to uh, the kids and go to a good cause here. Yeah, well, I mean, the programs like this, and, and that's what I love about programs like this, is that it's it's really easy for a lot of people to write a check, and there's not a lot behind it. But you do get $5 checks, and I bet there's nothing but love in every penny of that $5. Absolutely. Uh, and that's, that. I mean, that to me is just another fulfillment that keeps you going, that you say, you know, you, you, what, what, what impresses me about people like you and organizations like you have is is that some organizations be like, oh, I can't believe they sent me 5 bucks. Right. And you're sitting here going... <laughs> We got another five dollars. Like yep. this, we're we're five dollars closer to being able to keep this thing going. We're five dollars closer to buying some new skates. We're five dollars closer to being able to provide more programming for our kids. Um, that's really cool because yep. a lot of times people don't understand and appreciate the value of every dollar, absolutely. and uh, and you guys absolutely do that. So I'll put your site on my page and and sure. on this on this podcast uh, under the description and and uh, so you you do speaking. You do public speaking. You do some topics on customer service and leadership. I'm not going to give away the tape measure, but I'm going to tell you <laughs> the tape measure is one of the greatest things to, to consider and think about your life. Um, but you do keynotes. You do seminars. You yep. do workshops. You do, and it's not just for hockey. How do people tell a little bit about that, and how do people get a hold of you if they want, want to do that? Yeah, probably the easiest way is, again, through our website. You can yep. find my email address or, or call me here. But, yes, uh, do speaking on goal setting, smart goal setting, as you mentioned, customer service, uh, leadership team building, uh, working on one right now just on how to make staff meetings yep. more interactive and fun and engaging versus the, oh, it's yep. Tuesday at noon, let's push through this meeting but how do we how are we getting the best out of those meetings and, and really pushing uh pushing our staff to challenge the leaders uh to be better and yep. you know how can we help our staff succeed you know a little bit of what we do here is, is sit down and try to flush that out so yeah we got to do better well well yeah that's and that's a great way to close it out with one of your one of your two lines anything that i missed that you want to put out there you no. I think we covered all the bases. Um, I'm, I'm just uh, this. This has made my uh, Friday, my week, my month. Uh, this, this was like I think I told you when I saw you in Massachusetts a couple years ago. My goal was to get here, you know, at some point, and I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad you made I think it, it took too long, but uh, uh, I'm glad I got to be here and spend some time with you and, and, and hear your story and hear your your organization story and. You know, keep up the great work. I want to. I want to definitely explore uh, more and how we can help. Uh, not just get the word out, but let's figure out some things to uh, to help grow, help support you guys in the future. I see you got a new rink. That's the the plan for the new rink. So let, let, yeah. let, before we go, let's okay. the fundraiser. The important part of the fundraiser. <laughs> yes. I'm looking at this beautiful <laughs> drawing. Been staring at me for 48 <laughs> minutes. What's what's what are the pictures? What's that? What's that real reality? Look well, like? currently all our programs are at capacity here. So again, we serve over three thousand kids, and we have wait lists. Uh, we create different programming for them, because uh, mm -hmm. we don't want to push a child kids, away. Want to get more kids off the street? Yeah, and all but, nice. yeah. Uh, but in, for in order to expand our programming, we need to uh, expand and build a brand new two sheet facility. Our current ice rink is over 40 years old. It was built by the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. wasn't taken care of too well why they had it for 20 years until the not-for-profit came yep. in. 
And again, our focus a lot of time is, is on the kids and less on the facility. Or mm-hmm. We'd like to spend more on the facility. But anyway, so we're, we're in the throes of building a brand new two-sheet facility here uh, at this location. Uh, working with the city, it's going to be a $30 million project. Uh, we have just over $25 million of it locked up. Uh, we got to get to $26.3 million by February 1st, and then we can start construction in that next fiscal year. So How far off are you? We're, we're about just over $500,000 away from that. So uh, if we get that by February 1st, then we can start putting shovels in the ground by next October. So you got to we got to d- dig deep. So we got to get folks on this to uh, to share this podcast, share the story, share the link. Uh, Five hundred thousand dollars. I think that if a uh, uh, what's that? We just need to get a hundred thousand people to give five dollars a piece. So I mean, I got to get some more listeners uh, or some more shares. So, uh, but I think you're going to do it. As a matter of fact, I know you. I know. I know you're going to do it. One way, 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 one uh, we're going to have a follow-up and a celebration because you guys you guys got there. I think you probably have that celebration for New Year's um, and, and toast and, and toast the New Year in, right? So um, we're going to make sure that we promote this as much as possible and try to help you guys get there because what you're doing is great. And 3,000 kids in this rink in a dual rink, I think you can double that. Yep. Get these kids off the streets, get more kids at Harvard, MIT, the Olympics. Get them, get them, just get their mindset right. Yeah. Uh, makes a world of difference. So keep doing what you're doing. I am just Thank so, you. I'm so inspired by you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, on that note, I got nothing. I, I am just, I am without words on what a great experience this has been. Um, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, it's, it's got, it's, it, it's people like Ty that are in my life, and I always tell people that you know, look who's around you. Make sure you got the right people because if you have the right people that have the right mindset, even when you're uh, not in the right mindset, they can do so much for you. They can put you in that right perspective and that right place. And uh, make sure you have someone like that. And maybe it's just listening to this podcast. And if it is, thanks for doing that. Uh, I hope it makes a positive difference in your day. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap this up. As always, you can find us Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, BE space AU space SM. Uh, beawesome.com. Josh at beawesome.com is my email address. Uh, really appreciate the ratings and reviews you guys put in. That's what gets me my ex- added exposure of people that don't know me directly um, that that could potentially get something out of this podcast. And as you know, anytime you do a rating or review, drop me an email with your name and address. I'll put a shirt in the mail. I, I think that you given your time to do that uh, is a value uh, worthy of a shirt or a coffee mug or something that I have uh, that you might want as a, as a reminder for you to be awesome. So Looking forward to this is a going to be a, a three or four podcast weekend. I've got some others queued up here, so going to go rest up the voice, have some lunch. Uh, you guys have a great day, and remember to uh, to do awesome. You got to be awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, Diane.